Hello everybody, welcome back to the channel. Thank you so much. I know this is a weird setup. You haven't seen this in a long time. I'm joined by Steven Cassano. And uh, today we're going to be talking about all things Shakuhachi and his career. Really excited to have him here. Steven, thank you so much for uh, showing up and uh, letting me interview you. Oh, my pleasure. Uh, so pleasure. I'm also really excited because next week you're going to be giving a master class to my students as well. So looking forward to that. Uh, but today we get to focus on you. So tell us about you. Who is Steven? Haha, <laughs> interesting question. <laughs> Still trying to figure that one out. <laughs> Um, well, I grew up in uh, New York. Um, I'm originally from Long Island, New York. And then I um, attended the Crane School of Music for my undergrad in uh, piano. And was that classical after, piano? or It was classical uh, piano, yeah. yeah. And that's actually, that's what I'm doing as my um, main form of income is teaching piano at the point of school. That's, what, that's, that's fantastic. Um, okay, so favorite pianist and favorite composer, if you have one. Oh. Um, I love Rachmaninoff. I love Brahms. Kind of the heavier, darker. Uh, yes, I, I <laughs> Probably agree. Probably which led me to my love of home kyoku. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I was a, I'm was a huge fan of uh, Rachmaninoff as a, as a composer, and uh, especially of his, uh, of his Vespers. Uh, mm -hmm. Really enjoy his choral music. It's, I think it's underappreciated. So, all right. So you have a career. You, okay. So you're born in America. You um, go to music school. You get a piano degree. You're a wonderful pianist. I've heard you play. Why Shakuhachi? All right. Well, you know, Crane was an interesting place. Um, you know, I've always had an interest in martial arts and Japanese culture, even from when I was uh, a child. And then when I was at Crane, there was a uh, a guest professor who graduated from Crane in the 50s and actually moved to Japan. And uh, she actually taught a class on Japanese music. So that was actually my first introduction to Japanese music. And then one of my fellow pianists um, was from Japan. And then she knew I had an interest in Japanese culture. So she gave me a CD of just all Japanese music. And on that CD was Yoki Yamakatsuya playing Sanan. And I was just floored, I was blown away. No, oh, that's and your then, first. Yeah, if that's your first introduction. Yeah. Just shock. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it was Yoke Yamakatsuya. Yeah. Actually, no, that's that's not true. My first introduction, the first time I ever heard the shakuhachi, was um, um, well because I had an interest in Japan and I was a pianist. I was at Tower Records when they still existed, mm -hmm. and there was a CD by um, Keiko Matsui, mm -hmm. who is a <laughs> Japanese jazz pianist. I'm like, oh, I'll check this out. You know, what, what's this all about? And um, on the track The Wind and the Wolf, uh, her husband was playing shakuhachi. So mm. I'm listening to this piano jazz thing, I'm like, wow, this is really cool. And then all of a sudden that shakuhachi enters and I'm just like, what is that? Mm -hmm. I've never heard that in my life. And it just, what, what captured me was it just seemed to embody everything I had um, an idea of, of, of Japan. Mm -hmm. It just embodied the spirit, embodied everything. Now, I'll just for for myself, when I first when I first heard Shakuhachi, I didn't know it was the Shakuhachi. You know, I was, I was a young kid. I I loved samurai films, and mm -hmm. you know, the, every time like the battle scene starts or it's like dark night and there's a bunch of wind, you know, sounds, and you hear that overblown row where you get all the nice partials and uh, right, right from the fundamental. Uh, that was the kind of sound that I had of Japan since of a young age. And so then mm -hmm. when I first heard Shakuhachi as knowing what the instrument, placing the sounds with the instruments, like that's what that is and yeah. so it was a, a whole yeah. actually more of an enlightening moment of like the mystery has been solved from childhood of the really cool instrument with the samurais so yeah it's it's wonderful it it really does i think you're i think you're right to say that it's that entire world of just japan like you hear it and you your mind just goes there right away it's almost yeah. like you're being pulled in yeah i mean all those years of martial arts i mean it was just like bam you know it was encompassed in in sound I also did martial arts for many yeah. years as well. I, I did um, um, uh, mainly Taekwondo and uh, I did uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and mm -hmm. uh, Muay Thai. Uh, what were some of the what are some of the uh, martial arts that you've done or are still doing? Uh, when I was a child, I did Jiu Jitsu uh, awesome. um, on Long Island. And actually, you know, my my sensei at that time was actually training Ralph Macchio for the Karate Kid. <laughs> <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> which is kind of like ironic 
because uh, I, I was on a pivotal movie in my life, you know, and who knew I was, you know, mm. with the same person that was teaching Ralph some introductory stuff so he could go off and make a movie. But yeah, um, I did yeah, jujitsu. Um, I did Aikido. When I was living in Japan, I was doing Aikido. Mm -hmm. And I was just, you know, getting, you know, beat up pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it was it was, you know, I did it when I was I also lived in Chicago and I was doing Aikido there. But when I went to Japan, it was just a totally different experience, much more aggressive and um, yeah, no holds bar sort of like seriousness about what we were doing. Hmm. So um, back to music. So when you had this first course with the guest professor, what was some of the other music that you were introduced to um, from the world of Japan? Oh, you know, the typical, you know, we did listen to some Gaga. Uh, kabuki, uh, watch some no performances, and um, yeah. So it's just encompassed. Usually, incorporated like um, kitaro, like the new age, ah, uh, yeah, sort of music. Um, but it was really that you know that the basically the two CDs, the Keiko Matsui, and then that um, that sound of Yokoyama Sensei playing Sanon, which is, especially the uh, Yokoyama Sensei, that sound I just couldn't, I couldn't stop listening to it. Mm -hmm. honestly so what year was it i don't mean to date you but what year was it that you no, no, first no. got yourself a shakuhachi oh all right um probably 1992 okay so 1992 you get your first shakuhachi there's not online lessons there's not a, a lot of resource i don't think there's really any resources in 1992 no. for it no, 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 no. so what's your process of how did you get lessons how were you going about learning the instrument um, I just happened to see a um, a library performance. It was at a public library, and it happened to be Koto and Shakuachi, and they were just playing Sakura, something very simple. And um, I talked to the guy. I was like, "Hey, you know, I'm really interested in Shakuachi. Where, you know, recommend a teacher?" So he recommended Ronnie Selden, who was based in New York City. So my first two lessons were actually with Ronnie Selden, and that's where I purchased my first flute too. My first bamboo flute was but through him, but it was only two lessons. Mm -hmm. And then my wife attended uh, Northwestern, so I just kind of tagged along, was hanging out in Chicago, just working. And I happened to come across a gentleman called Ron Godsdiak. He wasn't a professional player. Um, he was in Japan during the Vietnam War, and he just picked up shakuachi. He mainly played uh, Sankyoku stuff. Um, he didn't play any Honkyoku. Mm -hmm. um, but he got me started. That's actually the, the how I kind of got started was through him. And he, he never even charged me for lessons. He's just like, ah, let's just come over. He always wanted to offer me sake. <laughs> like, uh, tea, tea's fine. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, he was just so personable and he introduced me to the Gaikoku. Mm -hmm. So um, now you're a Shihan, right? You're not, are you, yeah, you're Shihan. And you, I got, uh, yeah, I got my Ju Shihan from Yokoyama Sensei and Ishikawa Sensei, and I got my Shihan license from uh, Riley Lee. Okay, so is that in Chiku Horyu? Yeah, well, you know, because I'm from the tradition of Riley, um, it's both Chikuho and Yokoyama, because that's his training. Yes. So all of us in Hawaii have that same kind of background. We both do Chikuho and we do the Yokoyama repertoire. Okay. All right, fantastic. Um, so, how did you meet with Riley, and what was uh, what were lessons like? Uh, also, you did take lessons with uh, with Yokoyama, as you mentioned. So, what were what were oh, the well, things? Well, you... You... No, go ahead. ahead. Um, no, all right. So, once my wife finished with uh, Northwestern, I, I wanted to get my master's in ethnomusicology. So we came to Hawaii because um, this was only one of the only programs that actually offered shakuhachi. Mm -hmm. So I actually studied with Robert Herr. Um, oh, okay. who was yeah rob was a he's a he's a student of riley and john neptune they both went to uh both riley and john so there's this whole contingent of <laughs> this riley uh, ne uh riley uh, lee and john neptune uh lineage stuff um in, yeah in so but riley would of riley of would come correct? into town i'm sorry in u of h is university of hawaii correct university of hawaii okay. yeah Remember, I, I was living in Texas for a long time, so I, you say UH, I'm like, University of Houston. No, no, <laughs> yeah, but um, so my main studies in Hawaii with, with Bob, and then when every time Riley would come into town, I was studying with him too. So it was always a combination of the both of them. 
And we're recovering both Chico repertoire and the Yokoyama repertoire with both. Okay, fantastic. And so now today you have your own studio. You're both teaching piano and chakuhachi. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. I'm teaching through uh, Punahou School. Okay, fantastic. which is a K through twelve private school in Honolulu. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. I'm also just taking notes here as well. Uh, I also want to, you know, it's it's really I I like this. Um, the progression of this just seems so natural. It just seems like it just flows. Like everything was just set up in the right way for you to wherever you went, you met the right person. And this is just seems the opportunity was there for you to continue uh, on this Shakuhachi journey. And it, uh, I'm sure there was struggles that you're not mentioning, but uh, it seems this very organic flow. Yeah, no, I mean, just one thing led to the next. Um, so I was getting my master's here at uh, University of Hawaii. And then the, the Boulder Festival happened, the Shakuhachi Festival in Boulder, Colorado. Mm -hmm. And that completely changed my life. Mm -hmm. um, and, and which year was that? Which Boulder Festival? That, that was 90, 98. Oh, 98. Yeah. Right. So what was incredible about that festival is you could, I heard Yokoyama Sensei, I heard Yamaguchi Godo, I heard Aoki Deba, all of these people live, Yamamoto Hozan. Um, the only one, uh, uh, the only one that didn't make it was uh, Kawase Junsuke. I think he was having some health issues at that time. Mm. Uh, the but third, yeah, correct. Yeah, all all the great masters that were alive during that time were were at this festival, was just unbelievable. And um, because of my connections at the university, I was introduced to Tsukitani Sensei, who was probably the most renowned Shakuhachi scholar of the day at that mm -hmm. time. And then she introduced me to Ishikawa Sensei because she knew I was interested in coming to Japan and being in Osaka. And she knew mm -hmm. I was interested in the Yokoyama style. So she introduced me, and this is all happening at the festival, by the way. Yeah. And then she introduced me to Ishikawa Sensei. And then the following year, I was in Japan studying intensely with Ishikawa Sensei. Oh, that's awesome. And, and you were spending yeah. some time at um, Osaka University. I was affiliated with Osaka University, okay, but actually most of my research was at Osaka Geidai, because that's where the, um, the Tsukitani Sensei was teaching there. And I was part of the Osaka Shakuachi Kenkyukai, it's an Osaka research group. Mm -hmm. um, there's also a Komuso Kenkyukai in uh, Tokyo, in Shibuya. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, do they have a Komuso Kenkyukai in Osaka? I'm not, not, I'm not familiar of one but I, I just don't know about the one mm, that I don't know that I don't know so what was your focus on your studies with um with with Shakachi in um in the research that you were doing uh, the research was focused on the uh basically the movement of the Shakachi to the west mm. so I was looking at you now I wasn't really focusing on the Como so I was looking at that you know, like the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, and how it slowly was moving its way towards um, the West, mm -hmm. to the United States, Europe. Globalization. Yeah. It's quite amazing. You know, it, we see that in the Western world, of course, violin, viola, um, piano, saxophone, all these instruments spread throughout the world, like just rapid fire. And we don't mm -hmm. see it as much the other way around. I, I, right. Some of the... The other instruments I can think of that like are, are world renowned that everybody knows, but may not necessarily play, would be something like the didgeridoo, um, yeah. you know, or even yeah, like yeah, yeah. Uh, even like some percussion instruments of Africa, um, but or maybe even like a gujang or something like this, mm -hmm. you know. But shakuhachi wind instruments, yeah, it, it just my opinion. Maybe even um, maybe like Irish flutes as well, but you know, it's still, it's still yeah. more the Western world. So it's uh, it is quite amazing how much the how much influence the Shakuhachi has had in the world, especially in the world of film and in video games. Yeah. How much that those sounds have been used since you know uh, the early two thousands and even prior to that, uh, in a lot of film scores that have nothing to do with Japan, but they yeah. use the the sounds and it's quite amazing. Yeah, that was part of my research. I, I would I was looking into different movies and all the movies that these uh, the Shakuhachi was used in. And some of them, yeah, right, have nothing to do with Japan. <laughs> but, it, you know, the whole thing was the exoticism. It was creating a sense of uh, this kind of exotic, you know, sound. And that's what, that's the concept behind using it in a non-Japanese film. Did you have a, do you, do you have knowledge of or remember the first film that, uh, or one of the earliest films that have Shakuhachi in it that 
isn't related to Shakachi in the West? Or in, isn't related to Japan? That's not um, I, I can't think of anything offhand. The first time I heard it in film was when I was little and I heard I was watching Shogun, mm, which oh, was Shogun. A, a TV, yeah, the original TV series. So I was really little when that came out, but I watched it later in my probably in my early twenties, and then I realized, oh, there's a lot of Shakuhachi in this, and of course it's you know based in Japan. Um, and what the funny connection was when I was doing my research, um, because that album by Keiko Matsui influenced me so much I contacted her to see if I could interview her husband mm -hmm. and I did so I actually called her home <laughs> I got permission from the manager they gave me their home number and I, I talked to him and he's actually the player that played in that Shogun film oh really oh, yeah that's it's wild. just every time every time I'm dealing with Chuck Wachi, there's always some sort of interesting connection <laughs> fantastic all right Sorry, us taking down. Just keep continuing taking down notes. It's uh, it's really yeah, interesting. No, no, no. Oh, I, that's a that's a really wild connection there. That's as yeah, we, as the, the the Japanese would say, unme. Yeah. Okay. So, what are you doing now with Shakuhachi? What is the, what are the things that you're doing, and what are some of the things that you're wanting to do uh, with the with the instrument? Um, you know, just because of my work schedule and and family responsibilities, I'm not too aggressive in the sense I'm just doing what I can with the time that I have. So right now I'm kind of just trying to build my YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. um, I've been getting some uh, studio recordings out there. Um, mm -hmm. I was performing more, but you know, since the pandemic, um, I haven't really been performing at all I'm out in public. So I've been kind of shifting towards the digital format for yes. my playing. Yeah. Well, it, it is no, um, no mystery or, or <laughs> it's a, it's well known that I am online and that I make yeah. videos as well. <laughs> um, I actually did a concert yesterday online. It was the first one I've done uh, online about it over a year. Um, mm -hmm. I've done a couple con concerts here and there as well. And it's, uh, you know, I was, I, I think I was just like you of like doing concerts like weekly. And there was times I did, you know, three concerts a week and I'd be traveling all over the place and doing stuff. And then to just be completely stationary um it, it's it's quite different and i actually uh i don't know if you felt this if you feel this way but it, it actually it's it's quite difficult to practice now because there's not something to look forward to there's not something that i'm working towards because those events just aren't there just and also because um the you know the, the concert life is not the same um i think that that for myself doing doing youtube and, and doing like my jinashi series or commissioning composers mm -hmm. to do contemporary works have helped sustain my shakachi playing and it keep me to have some sort of growth um but i wanted to know some of the things that you do or some of the struggles that you find in um a post-pandemic world where concerts are not readily at, like happening um there's not much of a scene of music that's happening how do you keep yourself um, inspired to to practice and keep working hard on the instrument to make growth. I, I don't I don't know if I necessarily feel the same way as you. <laughs> I, it's um, I don't feel a, a deep desire or calling to go out and play public concerts. <laughs> I just feel a deep desire to play. <laughs> so for me in a way, the pandemic wasn't such a big deal for my shakuhachi life because it didn't affect my practicing at all. Mm -hmm. um, you know, of course, if I get the opportunity to play out in public, I'll do it. Because mm -hmm. uh, every time I do that, it's just challenging my own ability. You know, it's just pushing me to the next, next level. But I didn't feel like uninspired with my playing or, uh, or my practice just because of the pandemic. If anything, I was actually practicing more. Because mm -hmm. I was distracted less, <laughs> so I was actually spending more time on working on my sound, working on refinement in my playing, um, listening even deeper. Because now that I'm doing more of the digital aspect and the studio recordings, I could hear myself even better, which Absolutely. is um, frightening. <laughs> yeah. That was one of the things I noticed from doing um, like the Jinashi series and a lot of the other pieces that I was doing and uploading more pieces and like giving myself a, a time scale of okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna really lock in you know a couple hours every single day and work on the pieces that I want to record and upload. 
And there was just so much time um, invested in practicing much more than I would have before. And so I yeah. definitely felt that that sort of that same, I feel that same way there. Um, I definitely have for, for myself much more of a desire to uh, play for people. I, and I think this has to just do with my personality in general is mm -hmm. I don't like being alone. I, I love being mm -hmm. around other people. I love having people come to my house and that freaks my wife out, by the way, because Japanese are not about having people come over. And I'm yeah, like, yeah. we just met this people. Let's let's bring them over to our house. And she, no, no, we don't do that. It's like, no, we're having a barbecue. So she's had a couple of her own um, Texas barbecues now, right at the house in Japan. So she she's still at like huge culture shock of who yeah, are these yeah. people. <laughs> so, um, but. You know, one of the things I noticed, which has made it uh, a little bit frightening of how fast, um, and I'm, I'm sure you feel this way too, is how fast some of our students are beginning so good because they don't have anything else to do. So yeah. uh, my students, they, they sit at home and they practice for a couple hours a day. And I go, yeah, you guys are getting like really good. And it's like, well, Sensei, I, I have nothing else better to do. I can't, I can't yeah, do anything. Yeah. Um, and so there's there is a lot of benefits to it, especially musically for all of, of all of my students at least. Um, but it, yeah, um, so with regards to that, then and in the studio and the shakachi, do you have any specific goals that you're going for for with shakachi, um, or is it just mainly wanting to develop a, a closer relationship with the instrument? Yeah, that's more what it is about for me, and you know I. I always have some sort of project in my head and I just slowly chip away at working towards it. I'm not, you know, just because of my time is so limited, you mm -hmm. know, between work and family that I, I just, it, it, I have to really choose wisely and then just focus on that. Mm -hmm. So I just released my second CD, which, you know, that took a lot of effort um, and focus and practice. Absolutely. Um, and and now did my you do that all your, did you do all that all yourself, the recording and mixing? My first CD, um, my colleague at work is, he's a great violinist, but he's also a really good tech, music tech person. So he helped me with the first CD, and I learned so much from him on the first CD that I did the second CD totally on my own. Hmm. So I, I did invest in some good mics, and I mixed it myself, and um, yeah, everything was totally done in-house with that one. May I ask you, what kind of mics do you use for, um, for your uh, recording Shakachi? I use, I have a Rode, I have, um, I, I don't know the technical names, but I have, for the last CD, I had a Rode, larger Rode mic here, and then two larger, it's two small ones on the outside uh, to catch some of the ambiance, but they're all Rode, Rode brand. Okay, yeah, I, I use the same ones, I, I use a, a Rode a, a stereo pair. Um, yeah, as well. that's... Yeah, you use the, so you use those two for the ambiance, and then you use like a ambiance. Okay, and, and then I have a, a, the larger one, um, up, like, up, a, up like a dynamic or a, a, com, a condenser mic for the yeah, for yeah, the yeah. Front. yeah. All right, wonderful. That's yeah, that's fantastic. That's a great setup. And since I work at a school, I just you know I could just sign out the, the concert hall or whatever space I I need. So I don't actually go to a recording studio because I'm doing everything myself. I just need a quiet space. Mm, absolutely. So that's one of the great things about being a shakuhachi player. You just need the space and the technology and you're good to go. <laughs> absolutely. You know, there's a couple places in Japan that I've, I've wanted to, um, even just in the mountains, the natural uh, reverb that you get in, in walking and hiking in the mountains. That's one of the things that I think has really changed my experience with playing shakuhachi is I had played outside before and I've always played outside in you know in different areas like when I went to the Appalachian Mountains and went mm -hmm. camping I would bring my shakuhachi with me and play outside and I found probably that was the most insp uh, inspirational times of playing shakuhachi so it was also the most enjoyable times of playing shakuhachi um, and it's it's quite it's almost cliche but it's just like you know you're playing and you almost feel like the birds are communicating with you and then you hear mm -hmm. the sound resonating throughout the mountains and valleys and it really is quite something and when you experience it for yourself it's not just the, the, the cliche movie scene or it's not just the, the cliche story that you hear but it's something you actually experience and then it kind of locks you in with everybody else that you go yeah that really is something fantastic and, and amazing yeah. and it's too bad that that's impossible to catch on a, on an audio there's just nothing like the natural resonance and reverb reverberation that happens when you're by yourself 
50 miles away from the nearest small town of you know yeah. two people it's also really challenging too you know I, I look at when i practice outdoors as part of part of my training part of my shugyo Mm -hmm. the mosquitoes um it might be too hot especially here in hawaii the, the wind is going crazy and you're, you're just trying to focus on getting through your home kyoku um so yeah this this the really beautiful natural aspect of it but it's also the you know the struggle of it too that's really kind of interesting so i, I always look at the outdoor especially because i studied with riley and he was always challenging himself with outdoor outdoor training mm -hmm. um you know <laughs> when he because he was with uh kodo he was with the taiko group kodo mm -hmm. and outdoor training was what they did you know they were yeah. running marathons they were anytime they were they were training they were basically outside doing something and he incorporated that into a shakuachi playing so i kind of look up to that with with him yeah well we have a mutual friend who does a lot of training outside with shakuachi yes yeah, yeah. And so and i've joined him multiple times we went out once where it was negative two Celsius, mm -hmm. so it's not like a, a the Fahrenheit negative two, but um, um, where he we went out and we were traveling and uh, <laughs> when we got back down from from the mountain and playing, so down down by the actual city it's negative two, up in the mountains who knows how cold it was, but all I remember is not being able to feel from here to here, <laughs> and uh, he was he was telling me it's like now you're getting it. Now you're yeah. experiencing a little bit of it, but it it was amazing because what I noticed, and especially now here living in Japan in in this house, I don't try. To, I try my best not to use any air conditioning or heating at all, because I want to experience the how it feels to play in different seasons. Right. And this is one of the right. huge things that I, I want my my students to learn, and I, I think that you're you're touching on as well as you're talking is that playing outside and doing the shugyo outside and the different weather patterns changes your sound so yep. then when we play our pieces we can we can grab a, a sound of spring a sound of fall a sound of summer mm -hmm. a sound of winter um and and that's that's something that i've never really thought about of course we have like vivaldi's you know the seasons and yeah. and we're you know the like violin plays this this is what winter sounds like but what about the tone of winter and that's where shakachi is just so inter interesting for me because there is this kind of cold brittle icy sound that shakachi can get and but at the same time you can flip it and get this warm and um almost like a relaxed summer sound energetic yeah. spring sound um and kind of a withering um fall sound as well yeah i i did a takatsu with the person you're referring to <laughs> when I was visiting and yeah. um what an experience it really kind of just changed my perspective on on shakwachi and how to train and stuff like that just because um you know within five minutes my feet were hurting oh yeah right, right? just because I was I was wearing traditional Japanese sandals and I wasn't used to that so I was in pain most of the time <laughs> <laughs> and then you know we were stopping playing choshi then there's crowds around you you're still supposed to focus mm -hmm. you know it's like 90 something degrees <laughs> you know and in Kimono i mean there was well. just there's just so much going on and that you still have to be able to maintain your calm maintain your center and be able to get a good shakuachi sound mm -hmm. but the sound's not really important it's the fact that are you are you in control of yourself enough to actually maintain it really it's not about the quality of the sound or the beauty in that training process is can you can you can you focus can you actually do what you're doing in the present moment in pain with all these distractions and that's why i feel like um, shakuachi in particular and even music in general is basically training for life because as you get older you know things happen you know so the the training that i'm doing in in um with the flute is you know, if I spent with my spouse, how the health has a health issue, can I maintain my focus and calm? If I'm having health issues or something, you know, unexpected happens. So, I always looked upon shakuachi and and music as it's your training, and I always looked like as as performances like that too. Um, I always look like uh, as uh, it's a, like a type of shugyo. You know, you have. 200 people staring at you. Can you maintain your calm, your focus, and your control? Mm -hmm. 
can you express what you needed to and wanted to express in complete are, calm? Are you a stage fright person? I get nervous. Mm. Yeah, I get nervous. So for me, it's always been um, not the most natural experience. I enjoy it, mm -hmm. but I do get nervous. Mm -hmm. Probably the most natural performer I've ever seen is Riley Lee. Because mm -hmm. I've been backstage with him. And, you know, he's just chatting, completely relaxed, not, you know, and then he gets on, on stage and he's just such a professional, such a professional mm -hmm. and um, in complete control. Mm -hmm. And I think that just comes from all the training that he did. Yeah. You know? So, yeah, I mean, performance is good. I, I enjoy it when I just enjoy it, particularly when it's over. Um, <laughs> I think that was a great experience. I really enjoyed that. But I do, sure, I, I, I do get nervous for those sort of things. But I performed a lot. So I don't feel bad, though, because, I mean, Horowitz would get nervous. So if Horowitz gets nervous, then <laughs> I think it's, it's okay for me to get nervous, too. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's really interesting. Um, in, in my experience as, as a, from a classical musician, it's one of the things we share in common. I, I did... I played violin, mainly viola. I was an opera violist. I played in a lot of orchestras, um, string quartets, and the like. Um, the the most um, brilliant performers that I've ever met were always the ones who were just nutcases before they went on stage. Yeah. And um, one of my one of my best friends, an incredible violin player, he. Um, when right before he for <laughs> before he plays he's i was talking to him backstage because i think i'm a little bit more like riley in that area where i have no problem like joking around and talking before i, I walk on stage but my my friend I, I was talking to him he's like okay stop talking i need to center myself and, get myself <laughs> yeah. and so i'm like we're gonna be fine dude we, we've we've done this piece a million times he's like you are fine i'm not yeah. So yeah, I yeah. It, yeah, but he's a brilliant violinist, and so I, yeah. I'm like, I don't know why you're nervous. You play better than anybody I've ever heard. Well, there's great footage of Martha Argerich, just one of the great pianists of uh, yeah, you know, yeah. But you, you know, she's talking with her daughter right before she's going. She was uh, just a disaster. Yeah, a mess. Yeah, it, it's don't let me go out there. Don't leave. Stay right next to me. I, I yeah, I've read the interviews of her too, yeah. and it's just yeah, she's very. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, her like especially yeah, I, if we, she's gonna say i'm gonna go play prokofiev and on on stage i'm like yeah you're like the best at interpreting prokofiev <laughs> yeah, yeah. but she's like i'm yeah, so right, nervous right. about playing it so but yeah. as soon as she touches the piano it's like she's a completely different person i mean she's yeah. a beast i mean like wow yeah the control the energy the excitement everything's there but before but you know that's what's hard about being a musician is you're you're you have to be ultra sensitive to communicate the music, mm -hmm. but then you have to be ultra tough to get there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's that combination of that super sensitivity to sound, to feeling, to emotion, but then you have to be like tough as nails for the lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And not everyone could handle that, you know. No, and it, it's it, very tough, especially like the traveling musician career going between yeah. different, with schools, you yeah. know. I, living out of a suitcase for three months like for some people it's like yeah man sounds cool see the world until you realize you're actually doing it and then you're just like this is this is this kind of sucks <laughs> yeah 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 well my teacher um my piano teacher frank ioga was uh basically he was like the up-and-coming accompanist like itzak perlman was asking him to accompany him and he was like the deal when he graduated juilliard um and he was touring with uh, Leonard Rose, who was a famous cellist at the time. Uh, and, yeah. But he had a hard time with the lifestyle. You know, he, he would have food poisoning. He would still have to go out on stage. You can't just mm -hmm. cancel the concert, you know. Um, so, you know, after a while, he was just like, you know, he wanted to have kids. He wanted to settle down in the lifestyle. He just, he couldn't, you know, he couldn't do it. So he got a teaching job, which I'm great, grateful for, because he was one of the best teachers I ever had. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, it's, it just takes a certain breed to kind of thrive in that environment. Yeah, the, yeah. one of the things that a composition teacher of mine had once uh, told me about having having this life as, as a musician, especially the one that I was doing as uh, you know, traveling all the time, performing, and they said, people that are doing what you do 
at the end of their life have always told me two things. One, I wish I had a family, or two, I wish I spent more time with my family. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard. Yeah. And I'm at the point where, you know, my my older boy just graduated high school and my younger boy is 16 years old. He's graduating in two years. So, you know, once they're both in college and um, starting to grow up, then I feel like I'm going to have a little bit more freedom. Maybe mm -hmm. I could actually travel and, and travel through the, the states or something and start performing more. Mm -hmm. But right now, I just my responsibilities, I, I can't, you know, mm -hmm. I just can't. And I don't feel sad about it. It's just, you know, that, that's I have to do what I have to do. Yeah, I mean, I have a I have a little one on the way, and I have no I have no problem saying I don't need that concert. I don't need to do those concerts. I've got my student. Yeah. Oh, congratulations! By yeah. the way, I didn't know. <laughs> yeah, I want to I want to be home. I it's like yeah. every day, all I'm thinking about is, all right, just another two more months, and then she's here. Okay, all right, a little bit more, and so it's yeah. coming. Yeah, it changes your life, and it changes your perspective on things. And um, you just, you could still be successful. You could still do what you love, but you have to make adjustments, you know? Absolutely. And um, yeah, so I have no regrets about the path I've taken. Everything's That's good. <laughs> yeah. 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 All right. So I'm going to tell you my favorite pianist. <laughs> and my favorite pianist of all time is William Capel. Oh, he died very young. Very, very young. Yeah. Um, and he was, he reminds me because you told me about your teacher who was kind of the up and coming accompanist for everybody. And so, so was William Capel. He was working with uh, William Primrose, uh, as well mm -hmm. as a, um, a plethora of opera, great opera singers. Um, and I actually studied with, I did study piano for a short time. <laughs> I studied with somebody who knew him um, and uh, told me about a little bit about his, his life and his performance. And that's what got me to, to look up. Um, uh, look up his performing as well as Geza Anda and well, some other just unbelievably fantastic piano mm -hmm. piano players. Uh, but yeah, I, I wanted to just tell you that of that William Capel, it just popped in my mind and really enjoyed his recordings and, um, and whatnot. Yeah. Yeah. He, he was he, the next big thing actually. Yeah. He really was the next big thing. Uh, Dino Lapati was also another great pianist that died tragically very young. Uh, but you listen to his recordings now, it's just phenomenal, phenomenal playing. Yeah, out of this world. Both of them, actually, out of this world. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much for stopping by today. Um, I just want to recommend for everybody to go over to Steven's channel and give him a like and subscribe. Uh, watch the videos. He's got a lot of um, additional videos for um, lessons. Um, close-ups for seeing how uh, you know to play through a piece and you get a really nice side angle and you can see all the things that he's doing um, uh, technique wise with his hands so highly recommended as a great resource for Shakuhachi um, it seems that there, there are becoming more resources online for Shakuhachi uh, but I think Steven's resources are just absolutely fantastic and I recommend them to my students as well um, so one of my students recently was learning Kikyo Gen Sokyoku. I don't have a performance of it up online. Uh, and I was looking around and I'm like, oh, Steven has one. I listened through to it. <laughs> Sounds really good. So I sent it off to my student. And he's like, yeah, I can, I understand the piece now. So <laughs> oh, good, good. he's like, I didn't know how to do that fingering. Now I know how to do that fingering. So the channel is helping out people. It's helping out my oh, students. Great. So I really appreciate it. Uh, and we look forward to having you as a guest uh, next week and uh, to hear some pretty cool uh, Dokyoku pieces. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. All right. Yeah, thanks Thank for having so me today. Thank you.